Hello, I'm Patricia Henderson with Senior Connection Center, and this is your weekly connection. Today's topic is let your voice be heard. Let's face it, we all want to be heard, and there are two important ways that can happen now. You know them, voting and the census. But where can you get good information about voting? And what do you need to know to vote? And why is the census so important? Joining me today are Gina Iglesias, a representative from the Voter Protection Committee from the Hillsborough County League of Women Voters, and Marilyn Stevens, the Assistant Regional Census Manager from the U.S. Census Bureau. They're going to provide us some insight today. Thank you both for joining me on the program. Thank you for inviting me. Ms. Iglesias, would you share with us a little bit about League of Women Voters and what their mission is, what the purpose of the organization is? Well, the League of Women Voters was founded in 1920 and actually grew out of the women's suffrage movement uh, just six months before the 19th Amendment was ratified on August 18th, 1920, and women uh, won the vote. So we're coming up on a big anniversary for us. Um, it was established to encourage and continues to encourage to have informed and active participation of citizens in government and to increase understanding of major policy issues. We are nonpartisan in that we never endorse candidates or political parties, but we are political in that we um, advocate on issues, but we only advocate after we've done our own research, uh, we come to consensus, and then we mobilize to advocate on those issues. Uh, for that reason, the League has been a trusted source of nonpartisan information for a long time. Where are some resources that people can go to to get that unbiased information on candidates or issues? Well, in uh, 2006, the um, League started what is called Vote 411. And it will provide, uh, if you go to that website, it provides general and state-specific nonpartisan resources uh, to the public. Um, it also gives information uh, nationwide for your polling place locator. You can look up your ballot that you'll be receiving. And there's also candidate positions on issues um, and what has come out just recently is the Voter's Guide, which comes out during um, all elections. And you can view races and candidate answers to questions that have been posed by the League um, to those candidates. Not all of the candidates respond, but um, their names will appear if they are uh, running. In addition, very shortly, probably this week, uh, there are six amendments that are actually going to be on the November um, ballot in Florida. And those will be posted uh, probably this week on Vote 411, and most of the local leagues will probably post them on their websites. Uh, what's wonderful about the um, league is they will provide, whenever there are amendments, what a yes vote means in relation to voting yes on that issue and no. We have endorsed out of those six races, two races that we are um, advocating a yes vote and those are numbers two and three and the others we are advocating a no vote. So vote411.org is a very important resource, not just for local races, but for national races, state races, and additional information about polling places as well? Yes, you can find anything that you would need to find out. In addition, um, every county has a supervisor of elections office and that the 411 will direct you eventually to the correct county office if you are unsure of that. If you know your um, supervisor of elections website, it is a wonderful resource with all of the information you would need from early voting sites, dates. It also provides who will be on, on the ballot. Um, you can register online, you can update signatures online. So knowing your county supervisor's website is a terrific place also to gather information. That sounds like a wonderful resource. 
During COVID-19, we are in this world that we've never been in before and having to do things differently. A lot of people may be concerned about going to the polls. And we hear a lot about voting by mail. Can anyone vote by mail? Anyone in the state of Florida can vote by mail. Um, in the early 2000s, the law was changed and uh, Florida is one of the states where you do not need a reason to uh, request a vote by mail. So any registered voter can submit a request to their supervisor of elections and request a uh, vote by mail. I would like to point out that there is a lot of um, messaging and misinformation um, for uh, unfortunately right now, which is confusing the public, but sometimes you'll hear absentee uh, ballots referred to. Absentee ballots and vote by mail ballots are exactly the same. The only difference is the states that require you to have a reason for requesting a ballot are referred to as absentee ballots. But otherwise they are exactly, they are exactly the same, but not all of the states are like Florida. We are fortunate that people can just request it if they prefer to vote by mail. That's good to know because a lot of people, their reason for voting by mail is COVID-19. And so we want to make sure people have that information. Is voting by mail safe? Yes, and, and if I can just um, backtrack a little, um, Florida also has uh, many early voting sites. And so if you would like to vote in person, you can go to one of those sites. But additionally, if you've requested a vote by mail, ballot, you can fill out your ballot and you can actually drop it off at any early voting site. There are secure mm. ballot boxes at every single early voting site during the hours that those sites are open. Um, my husband and I actually did it in Hillsboro. We completed our ballots at home and we drove up and they had an outdoor tent and we were able to drive up um, and there was a box with a clerk and we were able to put our ballots right in, in the um, box. So I, if you, and also if you do request a, a vote by mail ballot and for whatever reason prefer to vote in person, you can take your uh, ballot with you, hand it in to the clerk and you'll be able to vote in person. Um, so that's two weeks of early voting. So rather than waiting till election day, which could be a busier day, we're encouraging people to um, go to the early voting sites. It, you can also, of course, mail in your ballot. And the supervisor of elections are requesting that people do it two weeks, that you mail your ballot back two weeks in advance if you'd like to do it through the mail, um, simply because there are some delays. And additionally, if there is a problem with your ballot, Perhaps your signature has changed um, over the years. Perhaps you've had an illness that's affected your signature. And when it's received by the supervisor and it does not match exactly, there could be a question. And so um, voting, uh, mailing them in early gives the uh, supervisor plenty of time to contact you so that you can update and correct any um, issues that might be on the ballot. That's good to know. And I did not know that you could drop off your mail-in ballot at an early voting site. That's important information. All of your information is very important and I appreciate you sharing that with us today. Another way that your voice can be heard is through the census. And joining me is uh, Ms. Marilyn Stevens. Uh, Ms. Stevens, why is the census so important? We've been hearing so much about it. Or so right, absolutely. And most people um, don't remember the last census. Uh, most don't realize that we're constitutionally mandated to count the entire population once every 10 years. And the primary reason we conduct the census is for apportionment to determine how many seats that each state gets in Congress. Well, all states would like to have all 435 seats, but it doesn't really work that way. Um, but the population determines how many seats you get. And the more seats you have in Congress, the bigger that state's voice and the wider 
the pipeline of resources. But lay people, there is another reason. reason. That's the that's the power part of the census. There is a money part of the census. More than six hundred and seventy-five billion dollars in annual resources are allocated, and those allocations are influenced by population statistics. We take for granted emergency preparedness and emergency management and health care services such as Medicare uh, and Medicaid or the Children's Health Insurance Program. Our schools heavily depend on Title I grants and special education grants and other types of funding. Um, the uh, nutrition program for children that allows schools to provide free and reduced lunch um, for students. And our college students are looking for Pell Grants. Um, we're talking about people that have lost their jobs, unemployment benefits. And then we look at services for seniors, such as uh, transportation services, as well as Meals on Wheels and other community development block grant organizations that depend on the funding. Our infrastructure, highway planning. Um, someone said to me recently, wow, that census is important. I need to know about that because all of those programs are important to me. And that's really the crux of the matter. Everything that we hold dear, um, that's important to us, that these census numbers will drive that funding over the next 10 years. And so I like to say, how does America know what America needs each decade? It knows it because of the results of the census. Absolutely. And as you mentioned, there are services that are provided across a lifespan. Of course, Senior Connection Center is interested in services for seniors. But as members of the community, we're also interested in services that impact children, impact our daily lives and infrastructure, the roads we drive on, all of those services. So there are services across the lifespan that are impacted by the census. And, uh, we'll yeah, and I'm proud, and I'm, I'm very proud of um, uh, Sumter County, Florida, and Charlotte County, Florida. Um, as a person uh, who is a senior citizen in her 70s, uh, when I looked at the first results and saw that Sumter County uh, jumped out front that first week and had the highest self-response rate in the state, and they have just decided that they are going to keep up being number one. Uh, we published some information um, a few months ago in our population estimates, and we look at a lot of different uh, factors, and one of those factors was age. And Sumter County, Florida, and Charlotte County are, have the highest uh, median age of any county in the nation. So when people say, well, I wonder if the seniors will participate, I said, you will have to eat their dust because Sumter County is, has the highest response rate uh, of any county in the state of Florida. They are, they are at 68, I think, 0.9, they're nearly 70%, and Charlotte's at 61%. They're as high as the state that the state uh, response rate. I said, go seniors, go. Okay, so I'm gonna throw out a challenge to the counties that we cover. <laughs> we uh, serve as the Area Agency on Aging and Aging and Disability Resource Center for Hillsborough, Manatee, yes. Polk, Highlands, and Hardy counties. So I am going to encourage you that we should be number one. One of our counties should be number one in the state. So we've got some work to do. Yes, especially in Hardy County. Seniors, we need your help in Hardy County because Hardy uh, County is really struggling as it pertains uh, to its response rate. Uh, the Hardy County response rate is only 43.2%. Mm -hmm. So that is a concern of ours, especially on this day, which is a landmark day for the census. Yes, it is. And that leads me to our next question. And that is, there's been some changes, some um, discussion about the, the deadlines, and um, could you just let us know where we are on that timeline and what the next deadlines are for the census? Right, I get, that's the question that I get a zillion calls every day, text messages, I swear my friends put signs in my yard. Um, when is the deadline for the census? I said today. Today is the deadline <laughs> for the census. And I said, I know you're not calling for yourself because you, I will have to unfriend you uh, from satellite. 
And, and, be, and the reason I say that is that we started the self-response period on March the 12th. Mm -hmm. Here we are five months later. This is the, first, this is the longest self-response rate uh, that we've had in my um, tenure with the Census Bureau. See, most people think that the way we conduct the census is that we come to your house, sit in the living room with the family, or sit on the front porch, sip lemonade and iced tea, and take the information. We did that through 1950. Starting with the 1960 census is when we went to self-response, where we sent a questionnaire to the household and we urged them to fill it out and mail it back to us. Then after a reasonable length of time, we followed up with non-self-responding households. Now here we are in the 21st century. And for the first time in history, we have three options to self-respond. You can respond online at my2020census.gov. You can respond by phone at 1-844-330-2020. And for the first time in history, we are supporting 12 non-English languages online as well as by phone. So we have different telephone numbers for our Spanish speakers, our Creole speakers, our Russian and Portuguese. Um, there are 12 languages that we support online as well as by phone. And then if you are a traditionalist that the high school students call old school, you can, we sent you a paper questionnaire and you can fill that out and mail it back to us, no postage necessary in the envelope that we enclosed. So no excuses for not completing it? I mean, there really are no excuses. Um, and um, one of the things is that uh, every morning, I have my team, uh, as, they, as they get up sleepily, to have an 8 o'clock call with me. <laughs> and I get on the call early because they're having, they're having little conversations. Uh, and I can eavesdrop. And I have them to contact the call center. And we call every morning for one reason, to ensure that there is no wait. And if there is a wait, then I can, I can report that there was a wait when we called in. So we'll know that how we need to work with that. And you can call from 7 a.m. to 2 a.m. in the morning and conduct the interview by phone. But as you say, today is a banner day for the census. It's August the 11th. Nationwide is the first official day that we start knocking on doors for non-self-responsive non households. So this is August 11th. That is, as you said, a banner day. Uh, most people will not be seeing this video until August 12th, so that has already started. Right. If someone is, um, has not responded yet, and they do still want to respond online, yes. can they still do that after this date? Yes, absolutely. Uh, the self-response options are open all during the non-response uh, period, until we leave the field at the end of September. And even when someone comes to your door, and I'm going to say this tongue in cheek, and um, you don't answer, I didn't say you were not at home, and you don't answer the door, they will leave a notice of visit card. And on that notice of visit card, it will say, we, we were here and we will come back. However, you may respond by going to my2020census.com or calling the toll-free number or mailing back your questionnaire. So on the card, and one side of the card is in English and the other side of the card is in Spanish. So you will, you will receive that notice of visit card and you can still self-respond. And the self-response period runs the length of the field operation. So we are always concerned about making sure our seniors and then all members of our community are safe. Yes, yes. If someone shows up at their door and they say they're a census worker, how can they right. verify that they are a legitimate official census worker? Yes, uh, we have, I, I had meetings with um, the governor's offices. We have seven states in the Atlanta region. So the meeting thing that I did yesterday and this morning was to talk with our governor's offices um, to send to them um, the different ways that people will be able to identify census workers. They will have on a mask they, and they must practice social distancing. They must stand at least six feet from the door. Um, the interview must be held outside um, of the home, preferably in a well-ventilated area. Um, also, they will, uh, each uh, enumerator will have a photo ID 
uh, they will have their uh, census bag, the Census Bureau on it. Also, the device where they will conduct the interview on has the insignia of the Census Bureau and the Department of Commerce. But even when the person comes to the door, the senior still has the option of, of saying, um, thank you, um, can you, or maybe some seniors told me that I'll say, I'll come back and then they'll call the toll free number and conduct the interview by phone or they can go online. And someone said, well, you know, most seniors don't like to use the internet, but as a senior myself, I beg to differ with that. Um, I got a call about uh, three weeks ago and I don't know how the man got my telephone number. The staff will not fess up to that. And he said, are you the census lady? So I thought someone was playing a joke. And I said, of course I'm the census lady. They said, well, well your website's not working because I can't get a hold to do my census. So I knew it had to be one of my friends. So I, I went online and I said, it, it's working. So I said, did you put the right URL in? And after the 10th try, I said, if you don't mind, give me your email address. I felt I could catch them then. And I said, I will send you the link. So the young man said to me, Yes, I will send you, give you my email address. He did. I sent him the link and I realized it was not one of my friends. So when he got the link, uh, he, we went online together and he clicked start questionnaire. And I said, put your name in. We go to the next frame. When it got to the frame to put your birth date in, of course, if you're doing the paper, you put in what your birthday, your age is as of April 1st. But online, it automatically populates your, your age. And then he screamed. I said, sir, are you okay? He said, wow, this machine is so, so smart. It knows my age, 92. And I'm thinking, 92? And he's online. I said, do you live alone? He said, no. My granddaughter is here with her, uh, her husband and her kids. They live with me. I said, well, you, you need to put all them in. He said, oh, no, I have all the information. So we went through the process. And we got to the end. I said, you want to go back to sit, make sure that we got everybody's name spelled right and their birthdays right? So we went back, we went through, then we got back to the end. I said, now you can hit submit uh, questionnaire. He hit submit questionnaire. And then, of course, you get the confirmation. Thank you for uh, doing the 2020 census. And you have a confirmation number and your address is there. And he said, wow, I got a confirmation number. I love this. I said, yes, I printed mine out, put my picture on it and put it in the frame as a historical document. He said, you know what? Whenever they let me out of my own house to go out and do some stuff, I'm going to have some copies made, put my picture on it, buy some frames, give it to my, my kids, my grandkids, my great-grandkids, because I may not be around for the 2030 census. And he said, you know, my computer was broken, and my, and my great-granddaughter said, um, Papa, you can, use, you can use my Macintosh. And I said, you're on a Macintosh? Wow, I'm impressed. 92 years old. So I told my staff the next morning, okay, that's it. I don't want to hear any more excuses. I'm done. Everybody you can do the census without delay. Yes, and I think that that is a great reminder that everybody has options of how they fill it out. And what you might expect from someone may not be how they choose to fill it out. No. But the important thing is that everyone lets their voice be heard through the census because it will affect us for many years to come. Yes. I want to wrap up our program today and thank you so much for being here, providing such wonderful information. And Ms. Stevens, do you have some last words for us? Yes, if, if, if your friends ask you, why should I participate in the census? And there are three things you should always remember about the census. It's important, it's easy, and it's safe. Ms. Iglesias, some final words for us. I wish I could be that succinct, but I <laughs> um, it, it, voting by mail is safe. It's been around since the Civil War, and um, there's been a lot of talk about uh, fraud and ballots being sent in. And if we can educate folks on actually how um, it's nearly impossible. I won't use the word impossible, although I feel it is impossible, nearly impossible to, to do that. Our ballots have marks on them, uh, timing marks. Um, every ballot in the, in the country is different. There are different races. The weight of paper is different. Um, needing the, the postmark to be going to the correct uh, 
supervisor of elections office without going into a tremendous amount of detail, but ballots also cannot be forwarded. So if they do not get delivered to, to someone, they are sent back to supervisor right. of elections mm -hmm. offices. So I really encourage people to get educated. Um, the Brennan Center at NYU has done 25 years of research and basically fraud is so negligible. It basically really does not exist. So I'd like people to feel comfortable. It's during COVID so important to stay safe. Voting by mail has always been safe and I encourage everyone to take advantage of that this year. Thank you both for joining us today. This is Patricia Henderson with your weekly connection and reminding you to let your voice be heard.